Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, Apache and PHP got together at the fail party this weekend, and we'll give you all of the details to get you to go patch your box. And then after that, Microsoft takes a few stabs at AES, and we'll tell you all about Nagios, the incredible project that will help you prevent a disaster. All that and more on this week's episode of TechSnap. everyone and welcome to TechSnap. It's episode 20 and it was shot live on August 25th for release on August 26, 2011. My name is Chris and joining me on the Skype line like every single week for all 20 weeks is Alan. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris. Welcome back. It's been 20 weeks already. I know. I know. It's a long it, time. It, 20 is a lot of weeks, but it, it really goes. It really hauls, yeah. and it's the the news has not slowed down at all. Nope. We have just a big of a, as big of a show we've, today as we've, we've ever had. We've never run out of things to talk about, which <laughs> never, has made never. the show a bit easier to do. No, and I want to say thanks to the people that have been uh, hitting up our Reddit subpage. We have a TechSnap Reddit subpage at links.techsnap.tv, and you can supply us with even more things to talk about. In fact, most of the content in the roundup this week was provided by our TechSnap Reddit subpage. So thanks to all our Redditors for doing that, and we'll have a link in the, in the show notes, or you can just visit links.techsnap.tv if you'd like to join our subreddit. And let us know what you think of it, because I'm considering setting up one for the last as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Alan, well, before we jump into... Uh, interesting story today, too. Uh, one of my customers for video streaming uh, just hired a new Linux administrator. Oh, yeah? And uh, he got dragged into a Skype conversation with a bunch of us about, uh, you know, setting up this event they were going to have. And then once I added him as a contact in Skype, and he sees my Skype profile picture, which is, you know, me with this headset on, he's like, you're that, Alan, from oh, that's Snap? <laughs> he recognized you from your avatar? Yeah. <laughs> But well, more importantly, it's random guy I end up working with is a tech snap viewer. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, totally. Yes. I love that. Uh, apparently, he was Googling for something about servers at some point and, and found our podcast. Dude, I love hearing that. I yeah, love that. Exactly. Yeah, I we're going, we're the going idea down. Of people finding it uh, randomly is good. I mean, yes. people are actually getting tuned into it. And uh, we're going down to uh, PAX this weekend. This is one of the last shows we're shooting before our recording at the studio shuts down. We'll be recording a ton down at PAX, but. Here in the studio, we're, you know, we're doing last tonight and all this kind of stuff. And uh, the last couple of years we went down to PAX, there's been a little group of Jupiter Broadcasting fans down there. So I'm sure we'll see some TechSnap fans, and I'll, I'll tell them you said hi while we're down there. Cool. All yeah. right, man. Let's jump into this epic show because uh, we've got a ton of news to get through. And then after that, we've got a couple of great Q&A questions. And one of them is from somebody who is in our IRC chat room right now. So that's the kind of immediate kind of answers he's going to get. But uh, before we get to the feedback, let's talk about this massive Apache vulnerability that came out this week. I mean, this is a really yes. big deal. In fact, I think I'm going to cover it on last tonight just to make sure the Linux crowd knows about it, too. For sure. Yeah. So give me the details on this because this is uh, so pretty scary. Earlier this week, uh, an attack script came out, uh, basically a short Perl script that uh, basically what it does is it connects to an Apache server and it does a byte range request. So... Uh, if you remember back uh, in the dial-up days, it, was, it became a big deal when all of a sudden web servers let you s support resuming a download, right? You download yes, the first I love of the file, and you could pick up in the middle. So the way that you do that with HTTP is you send a range request saying, I want bytes number, you know, so-and-so through the end of the file or whatever. Yeah. Right? And that would allow you to resume a download. Right. Or do multi-segmental downloading if you have one of those fancy downloaders that would download from a bunch of servers at once, downloading different parts of the file. Yeah, I used to have an old Windows app called GitWrite when I was a Windows user I used back the in the day. Same thing. Awesome. <laughs> Except for I, because I, I had it set up. I had a load balanced router that used a cable and a DSL connection. So when you did multi-segmental, it would download one segment over one and one segment over the oh, other connection. Alan, that's so cool. I wanted that so bad back in the day when bandwidth it was tight. It didn't work that good, though. Oh. <laughs> Basically, every time you would connect out, it would randomly send it over one or the other. <laughs> okay. And See, so I always kind of thought that's what it would be like. Okay. Yeah, it was very inconsistent and All had right. issues. But. So that, that wonderful end-user feature is essentially yeah. what's responsible for the catastrophe that Apache finds itself in? Uh, not enough checking about the validity of what they're asking for. But, but what the Perl script does is ask for 1,300 different segments. Oh, boy. So it's just like, I would like bytes one, zero through one. 1 through 2, 5 through 6, you know, 5 through 8, and just ask for all these. So what Apache has to do is it's create chokes. all these separate buckets and put the content in them. Yeah, that's going to kill so, it. Yeah, so it's going to end up making 1,300 buckets. You know, each bucket has a minimum amount of size it has to allocate in memory, not just the one byte to store the data, but it has the headers and the MIME encoding and all this other stuff. 
And so this little Perl script, but by default, makes 50 connections to the web server and starts, you know, on each of those 50 connections is hammering away asking for these 1,300 different buckets each time. And that basically cripples. So even someone with a low uh, bandwidth internet connection can take out a massive Apache server with, you know, like one even with like 16 gigabytes of RAM. As long as you make enough connections, you get a couple of machines doing it or whatever, and you can totally cripple that server. Right, because it doesn't take a lot of, it doesn't take a large amount of data from the client end to initiate it. Right, because actually uh, the this Perl script does a head request. It's not even actually asking for the data. It's just asking for information about the data. So, so it's Apache even thinner. do the same amount of work, but the client doesn't actually receive any of the file that it's asking for. That's yeah, nice and efficient, really, so if you think about it. Doesn't it. Use, it doesn't waste bandwidth on the, the attacker side. <laughs> That's pretty clever. Yep. Hmm. Uh, so there's no fix for it yet, but there are a couple of different ways to mitigate the attack. Uh, basically, the recommended one is uh, use Apache's uh, set environment variable if statement to say if, the, if there's more than five ranges in the range request, delete the range request, and that way the attack doesn't work. So this affects, did you say, that, did you say this affects all versions of Apache currently? Yes, 1.3, 2.0, and 2.2. 1.3. I roll my eyes, sir, at 1.3. Uh, specifically, 1.3 is past its end of life. Right. There will not be an official patch for it, even though a lot of people still use it. They we were really talking, upgrade. Uh, we have, we do like a little text nap pre-show where we chat with the chat room and stuff like that while I mm -hmm. push buttons here. Um, on, t on Thursdays at 1 p.m. over at jblive.tv. And one of the things I, was, I told you is I actually kind of just made the erroneous assumption that Apache 1.3 might even still be supported by some capacity from the Apache Foundation because I see so many people still using Apache 1.3. Yeah. Is this maybe finally the thing that's going to get people to move over to Apache 2? Uh, I don't know. It depends well, what the reason for not moving was. Yeah. Uh, there's no valid excuse for not moving. They really that's that's how I move. feel. Uh, and uh, this is this isn't even this is. I imagine there uh, for the people that need it for some reason. Uh, I imagine there'll still be a an unofficial patch. Uh, right. I mean, it's open source, so somebody could create something. Yeah. And and the mitigation steps solve most of the problems, so it'd be okay. But how many other vulnerabilities are there that haven't been patched, and how many are just not discovered? And because. E Exactly. Because they just don't exist in 2.0 because of the different architecture. Right, right, exactly. And Yeah, and ha yeah exactly. Uh, but th this kind of thing isn't totally new. There was like a, there was somebody reported something in 2007, right? Yes, a uh, Google engineer, a oh. security engineer, reported in January of 2007 uh, that basically the exact same attack, except for in the context he was reporting it about, it was about wasting the bandwidth on the host server. So he was saying... You know, they could take a one megabyte file and just request a bunch of separate chunks of it and have you send them a gigabyte. And his was, you know, if you specially crafted the packet so that you could expand your, your TCP window size to be really big, so the server would max out its bandwidth trying to send you the whole gigabyte at once without waiting for any acknowledgments, mm -hmm. then you could exhaust the bandwidth on the server. Right. When they reported this, it, uh, IIS was also vulnerable. So I don't know if that means that IIS is also vulnerable to this attack, the Apache killer attack. Oh, you know, very or possibly, Or maybe huh? Microsoft uh, fixed something back in 2007. Hmm. Well, I'm sure Microsoft will apply the patch back up to the IIS project, which will then make it... Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, hold on. I'm being told that that's not how closed software works. And in fact, I'm being told to go screw myself. Oh, I, that's Bill Gates in my ear, actually. <laughs> Well, okay. Yeah. So this is this is kind of a bad day for Apache. Do you want to move on to the next story? Because it kind of paints things even a little worse. Yes. All right. So the next one kind of fits in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you don't have to use Apache and PHP together, but we know so many yeah, of you every, out there yeah, do. Everything and, does. Uh, PHP version 5.3.7 is, is not having a great day itself. In fact, there's been a pretty serious crypto bug found in it. Well, you, you, you pair these things, two things together, and you could have yourself one hurting web server. So what's going on with this one, Alan? Uh, so PHP 5.3.7 came out on the 18th, uh, and it was pulled on the 22nd uh, because they found this vulnerability. Uh, since then, 5.3.8 has already come out, and it's all fixed. Uh, but basically, uh, what happened was they made a bunch of fixes to the Blowfish uh, module for the crypt function. Uh. Uh, for Blowfish password hashing. Yeah. Because... Uh, Depending on your OS, it was implemented differently. In BSDs, like OpenBSD and FreeBSD, Blowfish is built into the, the OS's crypt function. So PHP just passes through to that. But Linux doesn't support Blowfish by default. 
So PHP had their own implementation. And uh, a bunch of open source implementations uh, were found to have a flaw. But I think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and so when PHP was making their fix to that, they made a mistake somewhere and broke crypt for MD5. The Blowfish part worked fine. The new, the new Blowfish code works perfectly fine. But basically what happened is if you were crypting uh, without a salt at all, which mm -hmm. defaults to MD5, mm -hmm. or specifically with an MD5 salt, the crypt function would return only the salt and not the hash part. What good does that do? Uh, nothing. It's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's a mistake. What would happen is, uh, w so when you go to do a login attempt against the crypt function, what would happen is the, you would look up in your database the user's hash password. You would extract the salt part from that mm -hmm. and hash the password they're attempting to log in with with that salt. And if the crypt function is supposed to return a new full uh, crypto hash, which would be the, an indicator of what type of hash, the salt, and then the hash. Uh, but it was turning just the salt part. I see. So uh, if you upgraded to 5.3.7 and someone tried to log in on your website, they would get an error uh, saying that invalid password because the crypt doesn't match the one in the database. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if someone signed up new or changed their password, it would write their new password out in the database as just the salt. So now when you go to compare that, uh, when they try to log in later, you would crypt with the salt but, and your password, but the output would be just the salt. So no matter what password they tried, it would let them log in. I see. It would, it, it would be like that uh, problem that Dropbox had. Well, this is interesting because I was just reading a bug report about... Uh uh, Mac OS X Lion, that uh, if you're authenticating against another Mac OS X Lion LDAP server, whatever password you use, it'll accept, as long as it's a valid user account. It's, so it's one of those similar things where it's like, you would think something that basic when it comes to uh, user authentication would never, ever happen, but yep. uh, it, it's just uh, some code ch tweaks away from passwords not even mattering at all. Exactly. <laughs> it's so scary. It is. <laughs> All right. You officially scared the crap out of me for this episode. Yeah. Good. All right. We'll mark that down uh, in a little notebook yeah. here. <laughs> uh, specifically, PHP uh, caught the error in its unit testing, right, where it tests every function to make sure it outputs the expected results every time. Oh, good. But they didn't notice that until after they had published. So basically... Oh, not good. Uh, the unit test is supposed to be run on the code before they say, all right, this is the version that we're going to ship. But apparently... Uh, the crypt function never got tested properly. So when somebody reported a bug, they ran the unit test again, and it was like, oh yeah, it is broken. So why didn't we catch this before we published this version? Have they answered and that? They don't know. It seems somewhere along the way, probably someone didn't run the unit test they were supposed to run. So a fix must be in now that they've found it and they realized yes. it, right? Yes, the fix is in, and the new version of PHP has already been published okay. Uh, okay. a couple of days ago now. Okay, all right. Yeah, on the 18th, right? And this is the 25th? Uh, the, 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 the broken one came out on the 18th. That's what it was. They pulled it from the website on the 22nd, and the new one came out on the 23rd. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, the 23rd. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, there you have it. Any other thoughts on that one? Uh, this is why it's not always a good idea to upgrade the day the new version comes out. But then again, you know, when the new Apache comes out, you probably should upgrade right away. So it's always, you know, it's quite a, a problem. You know, and the big like, stuff like this, though, you, you can always go on, to forums count, or mailing lists. Right. But you count on the, you know, PHP people to make sure that they're doing those unit tests and yes. that there's not this problem with the version. Right. And it seems that something slipped through the cracks there. Well, put, sir, it, you do kind of count on them becoming like, oh, I scooted over too far. You do kind of count on them becoming like the, uh, this process testing. And, and when you are a yep. busy system administrator, sometimes you are pressured just to push right through things. Yep. And I can see how somebody could have easily but deployed yeah, that on their system. Uh, it's quite important that you get on the, the mailing lists. Uh, yes. There's specific, they have separate mailing lists for just security announcements and stuff that are really low traffic. You know, you're not going to get right. discussions. It'll just be security vulnerability well, announcements. And, and a lot of them will offer you the option where you sign up. I know everybody, at least me, I, I hate email, and I don't want crap in my inbox. Yep. But a lot of them, you know, you can say, all right, just send me the daily summary. Just send me the weekly summary. It kind of depends on, on your, you know, your how yeah. fast you want to patch. But 
Uh, that way, you know, you don't get inundated with it, and you can be one manageable right. thing just on your to-do list. Just go, go read through this, and and if you, the, you, you know, if if you keep everything kind of consistent, one of the keys here is just keep everything as close as possible to the same version. So you only really have to track that one thing. You don't have to track yeah. various different versions of stuff. But yeah, like with, with FreeBSD, <clears throat> when you would sign up for the announcements mailing list uh, for the security one, you right. get only security vulnerabilities. Right. So in the last like three years, I've got seven emails from them. Oh, that's, there's only that's been not those bad. Three. Exactly. Right? So I only get an email if there's something really important I need to know about right now. Well, I'm on the Red Hat mail list, and I think I get two a day. Oh. Well, <laughs> see, but see the, they, they do everything in the repo. BSD, yeah, right. They separate in BSD. Those are two separate mailing lists. Mm -hmm. There's one for just BSD, and there's a separate one for the entire port stream. Right. Right. Yep. But absolutely. also, that in following the entire repo there is easier than trying to sign up for the Apache mailing list, the PHP mailing list, the MySQL mailing list, and every other oh, one I that you see might that. follow. Right. You know what they all need to do is you get subreddits like we have. Boom. Or, problem solved. Well, uh, with FreeBSD, like we talked about last week, they have that vulnerability uh, and exposures ex uh, markup language. Right. They have an XML file that oh, you can yeah. follow as an RSS feed of just what's vulnerable. That is really cool. I like that. All right, you, now, RSS is a more passive way, right? Alan, we got a lot of show left. We got to go to the next story. We got to do it. We got to do it. Cause we got we got a couple of huge feedback questions. Are you ready? We're gonna jump. Here I go. When I think of Microsoft, everyone, I don't often think of elite hackers burning their GPUs over uh, long periods of time trying to crack encryption. But this next story is setting out to prove me wrong because Microsoft researchers have proved a potential vulnerability that shakes AES to its very foundation. All right, I might be exaggerating a little, like that, there. a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what's going on with AES? Yeah. Is uh, AES destroyed, Alan? Are we all no, screwed? No, it's not. <laughs> uh, it's just uh, they found a way to make attacks against it three to five times faster. Yeah. I'd, Which sounds bad until you realize that yeah. the attack, the, normally the key space would be two to the power of 256. Uh, Simply Cy Cycling said I was being very pro wrestler there. I was kind of going yes. for that vibe, you know, very Microsoft hacking, very, very, yeah. yeah. All right. But, uh, yeah, so even with the uh, three, to times, three to five times faster, that just means that instead of the key strength being 2 to the power of 256, it's like 2 to the power of 254.1. Yeah, it's like they remove a couple of bits, right? Is that what it is? or Basically. Uh, yeah. Well, they just found a way to, to attack it fast, to do cryptanalysis on it, uh, to kind of glean that, you know, eliminate a certain section of the keys that it could possibly be. It's interesting, though, because uh, guys like uh, Bruce Shiner... Uh, who's Schneier, yep. Schneier, yeah, who's a security expert, and he says, uh, the safety margin of AES continues to erode. And he says, uh, always uh, attacks always get better. They never get worse. He's kind yep. of, he's kind of, uh, he, he, uh, he's kind of pounding this drum that AES might be doomed. And uh, um, get, Actually, not specifically. He specifically says not that in his thing. Oh, no, you know what? I apologize. You know what he's doing is he's, 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 uh, he is quoting an expert from the U.S. National Security Agency who says that. Well, but yeah, well, yes, attacks will always get better, not yep. worse, right? They're not going to forget. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, of course, that goes with given, but uh, that's, that's always a given. But the question really is, is AES like on some sort of downward slide of losing? Um, well, every crypto thing is always on a downward slide. True. Uh, but, you know. You're on notice, Bitcoin, <laughs> right? Well, Bitcoin's a hash, not a cryptography. But there, there is a there is a cryptology there that you, if somebody could eventually yes, crack. Yes, SHA two fifty six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not it's not the same as AES. Right. No. Uh, but yeah. So basically, he's saying that, you know, he wants to see the number of of rounds in the uh, encryption go up from like eight to sixteen. Yeah. To make it, right? You know, to increase that margin of error, that right. margin of security, and of course. Hey, do we have? A performance penalty for that, but you know that's always a trade-off that you got to think about. I mean, even with this new vulnerability, these Microsoft researchers have found, we're still talking billions of years here to crack. Yeah. We... So billions of CPU hour or billions ah, okay. of years of CPU time. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you had a million computers, that's much less time, but it's still like a thousand years. So <laughs> right. Well, you know, there are there are uh, yeah, and I guess as I guess as you but, figure, you could you could you could expand your hardware base, and processor speeds get faster, and the density of processing gets faster. And so if you get you know different kinds of processors in the future, like quantum computers and so on. And one we're going to talk about later. It's in the more show, that huh? you know a lot of this is based on when you're when you decide what encryption algorithm to use and what strength to use on it. You're normally considering 
how long does this information need to remain secret for? Right. Right, and is it going to outlive the crypto? The answer of that is like 50 years. You really have to, you know, aim for the sky. You know, and if it's, you know, if the information is useless after two years, then it's not as big a deal. Right, like uh, information that gets encrypted over SSL to your banking zone. Most of that's not good after, you know, a couple hours even. Right, it's really time sensitive. Yeah, and so, you know, the fact that that's safe for the next 10 years is fine. Oh, yeah, that's no problem. That's, that's more than enough time. Right, but, you know, if it's classified information that needs to be secure for the next 30 years, then that might not be good enough. I agree. Okay, I see where you're going. So, so really, it's, it's not so much how, how long until we are actually able to crack it, but will that just lo is there a very good chance that time will be longer than you need it to be protected for? Right. And well, in, the, in the case of this attack, it's more, you know, how many more like this are we going to find that are going to keep chinking away at it until we need to change it? Yeah. Now, you have a couple of really good follow-up links in the, um, for this show story. One yep. to the full blog post by Bruce uh, Schneier. 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 Whatever. And also a full paper write-up with the details on what they actually found and yep. also and the article itself. The executive summary there is, is quite good and kind of tries to uh, kill all the FUD about it. Yeah. No, that's really cool. I like the nice logical. This is it's, just, these yeah. are the facts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, killing FUD is not something Microsoft's known for. <laughs> Touche, sir. That's a good point. Hey, sometimes uh, on the other end of that uh, FUD machine, aren't they? Well, well, most of the work was done by uh, researchers from uh, universities in Belgium and France. So, Chatroom's giving me a hard time because I can't they, pronounce it. They names. were taking uh, sabbaticals from the universities to work with Microsoft's. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I see. Hmm. So they were working at the Microsoft Research Labs. Right. But they're still from the university. They're just. Cool. Took time off to work with Microsoft on this encryption hacking thing. Wow, you actually just took a little credit away from Microsoft, though. I gotta, I gotta go back and edit out that awesome pro wrestler intro I did for the story now because it didn't really apply well, anymore. No, it's still Microsoft paid for it, so. Okay, all right, sure. I mean, that's kind of like being an awesome wrestler. If you pay for an awesome wrestler, it's kind of the same thing. So, should we? Uh, any other notes on this one, or should we jump over to the feedback? Uh, no, I think we're ready for feedback. All right, Al. Now you guys heard it. It's time for the viewer feedback. Alan, the first question on our feedback roundup is actually uh, the one that we set up last week as a continuation. You're going to do a couple of these. It came in from Dreams Void, and he wants to know a few practical solutions to do sort of different levels of server failure. You know what I mean? Like if you had a, almost like an identical backup server, and you had a main server, like a web server or something, if that guy went down, how could you get this other server to take over and start doing some of that work? And you got to think there's a lot of stuff involved with that, like data that has to be shared between the two, and if they have to know when each other goes down. Last week, you started answering this question with one potential approach, but now this week, you're going to give us another possible way to do this, right? Yeah. So uh, the original way was with CARP, and that relied on the two servers being in the same physical location. Right. right. They had to be on the same LAN so they could share one IP address. Right. And it would all happen, uh, you know, transparently. Mm -hmm. uh, this week's solution is using DNS. Uh, and so you can have your servers in different data centers or maybe different countries or whatever and have them fail over that way. Now, I love this one because now you're taking yep. total dependence off, off the data center altogether. So, yep. like, if exactly. they have some sort of issue like a fire or a, their internet connection gets cut and you just yep. can't do anything at the dns level that's going to happen in the cloud right exactly what uh, do you use yeah. to do this uh so what i use is a, i use dns failover and i use a service from a company called dns made easy mm. which it may sound like it's you know a super user-friendly company but it's actually more of a professional company so it's not very easy uh, is what you're saying uh no no it's easy to use uh <laughs> but their inter interface was more designed for pro users, but they have a new one that's uh, very nice. Oh, cool. Basically, if you have to know a little bit about DNS to use it. Oh, okay. But, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same interface you get with GoDaddy or whatever else, except for it has extra features. Uh, one of these features is monitoring, where they'll email you when, uh, you know, an IP address doesn't ping or whatever. But they can also do other stuff. They can connect to a website and look for a certain string on the website. So they can make sure the website is actually up and showing the right data. I really like that. Yes. Yeah. So or, then you know, make sure that it's actually, you right. know, if it's pulling up, if you're just checking that your website responds, it could be responding with database error. Can't connect to the yep. database. Yep, that's and happened to me before. Exactly. So with this one, you can make it check for certain messages on the website. And that's like cool. That. 
All right, I love that feature. Yeah, so uh, I use the third-party service called DNS Made Easy. And in my, once you move your DNS to be hosted with them, uh, you go in and you enable the monitoring where uh, every minute from different servers all over the world, they'll check the website and make sure it's up. Now, they can check a TCP port or a UDP port, or they can ping it, or they can check the website, or a okay. bunch of other stuff. Yeah, okay. They can also do uh, check SSL as well. Oh, good. Uh, in, case you're, in, now, in case you really uh, want to watch for that. So in the control panel there, for the, you know, the IP address of www.mysite.com, you put in more than one IP address. Right? Your, first ser your primary server, your backup server, and your like, emergency server or whatever. Right. And so it starts um, monitoring them, but it only uses one at a time. It's not like a round-robin setup where you just put in a bunch of IP addresses and it randomly uses one each time somebody requests it. With this setup, it only uses one at a time. Right. So it monitors that first one. And as soon as it detects that first server is down, it s changes your DNS entry to point to the second server. And if that one goes down, it changes it, and it keeps going until it finds a server that's up. Or I like that. Servers. Yeah. And uh, because of the way their system works, when you make a change, either manually or the automated one with this uh, DNS failover, it updates on all their servers instantly. There's no propagation delay. Hmm. And when you, when you set up this failover on a certain entry, they change the DNS time to live on that entry to be like one minute so that you know, people will get updated right away. That's uh, how they accomplish like the no delay, right? Is really with that time to live thing, right? But also the fact that all their slave servers uh, update from the master instead of with typical DNS. What happens is the slaves check once every so often to see if the serial number is updated on the master, and if it has, then they copy the zone, right? So that means that the masters can take a couple hours to notice every change. With this system, uh, their master notifies all the slaves every time there's a change saying, this domain has changed, you need to come and get a fresh copy. Gotcha. And so that lets them push updates in. So their, their time to update a record is measured in milliseconds, whereas most ISPs are minutes or hours. Right? Like, if you make a change at GoDaddy, it takes a little while before it shows up. Right. But this, it takes, you know, one second. And then it shows up everywhere in the world that way. That's very convenient. So you can respond immediately to an outage, yep. and you don't have to do the. All right, well, I've pointed this. I've pointed this to the new server, but I, I think DNS propagation is probably going to take about 24 hours. You know, okay, yep. we're about four hours into it. Still working in. It's working in Seattle now, but uh, people over on New York don't seem to have it yet. Yeah, so it it solves that issue. That's cool. I like and that a lot. That it, sounds like something I would I'd want to use for Jupiter Broadcasting, really. Although Scale Engine would never go down, right, Alan? Right. <laughs> Well, specifically, we use it for the front page of Scale Engine. <laughs> oh, uh, of course. So, it, by default, it goes to our main data center and hits that. Uh, and but if that were to be down for some reason, somehow, uh, it fails over to one of our backup servers that's in a different data center. But the thing is that the content from our website comes from a centralized uh, content management system that we have for all the websites in our business. Now, that is three separate servers in different data centers. Some of them are the same as those other servers. Uh, and it uses DNS failover itself. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all three of those servers appear as one server for the CMS. So if those were to be down somehow, then our backup web server wouldn't be able to get the content to display our website. So, so even though the backup server's up, the, the database for the content of the website isn't. Right? So DNS Made Easy is checking that uh -huh. it's getting the data, not just that the, the web server is up. Not just a reply. Checking that the website is up. And if that fails, it fails over to a third backup server, which has static HTML copies of our website. We use uh, wget and do a spider and save separate HTML files of the website once a night. So well, could Dreamsport do something like that, where he could have like his main server, this is my website, this is where I invest my money and my resources into building a nice box, but then I have this, like, this really cheap GoDaddy shared host over here that I could use easy DNS to fail over to, it would just have like some more basic subset of site functionality. Yeah, or it could even just be, you know, your, your version of the Twitter fail whale, saying, totally. hey, our website's having trouble right now, 
it'll be back soon, Actually, rather than just a timeout error. That's a great idea. Why not redirect them to a page that has like uh, a Twitter account status message on it or something like that? Exactly. You know, where you could just where you could people could go to get feedback. If if you're gonna update people via Twitter that your site's down, then redirect them to a page with your Twitter feed embedded in it. Well, it it could literally just be uh, an HTTP redirect to your Twitter account yep. page. Yep. Even. Yep. Or Keep whatever. it fast. I mean, it sounds a little chintzy, but that level of communication it's, is, is a it's great thing. It's better than, uh, you know, couldn't connect to this website because it's not responding in time. You know, it's better than the browser's error that the website is unreachable. Do, do, you, hear, do you hear, like, the helicopter circus that's going on above me right now? There's like, there's, like, five black helicopters having some sort of helicopter off dance party above my studio right now. I don't know. I'm hoping it's not picking up. But it no, is, like, care. some sort of aerobatic show up there of, it must be who can fly the loudest above the studio contest, I, I think is what it is. <laughs> um, so, easy, uh, easy DNS also Wait, sounds DNS a little bit... Easy. Easy oh, DNS, DNS made easy. Company. It also sounds a little bit like uh, Dynap, DYNDNS.org. Have you, have you seen a little those bit. guys? They have a service for that as well. Okay. So that's a, that's uh, another one. But the, these guys are more of a uh, corporate scale thing. Now, uh, you can get, you know, your regular business website. It's uh, with the, without failover, it's $29 a year. With the failover, uh, each extra failover host is an extra $5 a year. A year? That's so, cheap. That's nothing. Yes, $35 a year. Domain names used to cost more than that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's $35 a year, and that gives you like a million DNS queries and so on, so on. And then they have up to, you know, corporate plans if you get, like, you know, a billion DNS queries a month or something. Oh, Which I see. But you in, like, the top 0.001% of websites in like, the internet. Like, you're so. such a baller that just the DNS requests for your website are going to put a load on our system. Like, you're, when, you ha when you need that kind of plan, they have those, too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and All they right. have a 100% uptime guarantee with a 500% refund for every second of downtime. Whoa. That's not so bad. It, that's a pretty good SLA it's right there. It's not as there. good as Scale Engine. Scale Engine's refund is 15 times. No, so I wish Scale Engine would go down more often so I could make a good profit. Yeah. <laughs> but fortunately, I'm losing money on the deal, I swear. <laughs> All right, you ready for the next question, Al? Uh, yeah. All right. The next one comes from Al Reed, and he's in the chat room today, so that's exciting to get to answer this one. I love it when people can join us live over at jblive.tv at 1 p.m. on Thursdays. And he wrote in and asked about Nodjos, and he's heard probably Nodjos is one of these things where I know I can use it to track and alert me if something goes down. I think I can maybe even get some maybe graphs and things like that. But, Alan, do you mind sort of setting up what Nodjos is, or Nodjos, however yep. you want to pronounce it, and how you use it? Right. So Nodjos is an open source network monitoring system. Uh, so yeah, the basic functionality is, you know, you monitor uh, different aspects of hosts, like physical or virtual servers and routers and switches and stuff like that, but also services, which are like the programs on that server, like your Apache server, MySQL, or whatever. Right, and you could do uh, that through pings, you could do it through port checks, you can do it through SNMP, yep. whatever. It depends on what you want to monitor and what its capabilities yeah. are, but Nagios can, you know, get yeah. all kinds of stuff. It comes with built-in checking tools for a lot of different services. Uh, for example, uh, the most basic monitoring is just pinging the host and see if it's up. Yeah. But, and what it can do is it can set off an alert if the ping time, the latency, gets too high. Right? If all of a sudden that host's ping reply is 700 milliseconds when it's normally 70, then it can set off an alert. Uh, and it can also set off an alert if packet loss is too high or too low. Yep, this is really or great if you want to be able to just uh, get a feel for uh, how the performance of things are going. Right. You know, and, oh, okay, we need to maybe take that guy to production. He's not uh, responding to the users fast enough kind of a thing. Right. Which is good, to, it's power, good to find a problem before it is a problem. Exactly. Uh, but the real power of the network monitoring system is not just alerting you, uh, when something's down, uh, but having monitoring and graphing of performance over time, right? The easiest way to tell if something is working like it normally does is to be able to see on a graph, right? Yes. Uh, for example, with uh, all of my SQL servers, my MySQL servers, uh, the Nagios monitoring tool for MySQL doesn't just check the port and see if MySQL is answering. It connects as a user that has one of the special privileges, and it checks the status command. So hmm. it monitors how many queries per second have been done. since. So it looks at how many queries have been done and knows how much were done last time it checked two minutes ago, and it factors that out over two minutes and says, oh, so the server's doing 100 queries a second. Yeah, then you, you, can, you can actually you can map that into a chart, right? Yeah, so I have that on a graph. 
And then I also graph the number of uh, concurrent connections to the MySQL server. That's nice. So, so then, you can get historical data on if uh, yeah usage increase or decrease. Yeah, and so I can see the trend of, you know, prime time each day is this, and then all of a sudden I see this big spike, I know something different is happening there. Right, right. Uh, I'll tell you a brief story. One of the ways that uh, we found out about uh, a hack attempt um, was because we had uh, a, a Nagios-like system set up. It was, yep. uh, I'm, I think it's Cacti. I'm forgetting the system yep. that does the graphing. The other ones. And well, we used Cacti by itself and pulled the data in, and we would throw these charts in here. And we actually found that just by monitoring this, we saw a massive uptick in our FTP connections one time. And yep. we, that was actually what ticked us off to the fact that uh, one of these servers had been hacked, was using this sort of monitoring. The system was running fine. It was serving requests more than happily to these hackers. And so yep. there was no real, like, service outage. But by monitoring these metrics, we were able to expose a whole new level of data that still led us to a major problem. And so it's super yep. valuable. Right. So with my MySQL graphs, if I notice, uh, you know, an increase in the CPU load on one of my servers, I'm like, well, what's causing that? I can look at the graphs and say, oh, look, they're corresponding at exactly the same time the CPU load started going up, the number of queries per second in MySQL went up. Yep. So maybe that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And when you do it for long enough, you can actually start to get a feel for, like, budgeting purposes. You, if, yep, if, this, is great. this is great if you have to, like, justify purchasing a new server. You can say, you know, yep. if I look at this graph... Uh, oh, okay. I'll, actually, I'll tell you exactly how I've done it. With clients, I'll pull these kind of reports and I'll say, all right, well, here's the last six months of the CPU and memory usage of your server. And you can see you have a kind of steady, steady cli climbing, climb like this. So I'd say probably in the next three months, you're going to look at replacing this box. And when you have that kind of data there, you really know yep. that you're spending your money and your time on the right thing. Exactly. Or, you know, you can, if you can uh, even qualify that by having one graph showing the response time of the website, Mm -hmm. And one graph showing the CPU load. And it's yes. like, look, as the CPU load is approaching more than 80%, the average time to load the website keeps getting lower and lower. So we need more CPU power to get that time to load the website back down. Yeah. Yeah, so that's just one aspect, right? Because then Nagios yep. also has things in there like uh, there's, some, there's some network mapping capabilities and host identification. Yes. Uh, specifically, you can set up uh, child-parent relationships. So if you have a bunch of servers behind a router... And you're monitoring, so you can tell, you know, when that router goes down, we automatically know all the hosts behind it are going to be unreachable. Yeah, so don't alert me a hundred times. If this, if this For, key yeah, device went down, just assume. Down. Yeah. Then, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, if this router is down, then everything behind it is going to be down. <laughs> That's one but of that, my favorite features, because in early, yep. early monitoring systems in IT, they didn't have that intelligence. And nope. if your router went down, you got notifications for every single every thing. Single host. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That can even become more of an issue now that we do virtualization on a scale like this. You monitor your virtualization host, and you set all the virtual machines you're monitoring separately as children of that. If that one host goes down you know that all the children behind it are going to be down. Right. And, and Clicker points out in the chat room, he says, don't forget to mention the fact that you can also do a level of plan change and configuration management too. So you can say, all right, Nagios, 4 p.m. today, I'm going to go patch all these servers and they're all going to reboot. So you don't yep. go ahead and log they went down, but you don't have to send out notifications. Exactly. And you, uh, it can factor that into uh, Nagios can generate uptime reports. Yep. And so you can say it had this much downtime, but this percentage of that downtime was scheduled. And so... It, you know, isn't considered a factor in your service level agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, have we mentioned that Nagios is open source and free? We I should probably... So. You, I did you, that. Very okay, good. Yes. All right, I want to make sure everybody knew that we're not talking about something you got to go spend money on. You can just go get this, go read some how-tos, and you can get rolling on it. Yeah. And, but what, when it really starts to shine is when you start using things like the simple network management protocol mm -hmm. interfaces that, like, every network device already has this built in. Uh, but you can also get the daemon that runs on all your servers, too. Uh, so for example, we use it to monitor power utilization. Our uh, PDUs, power distribution units, basically fancy power bars, except for they have an Ethernet connection, and we can uh, actually turn each server on and off using it. So if a server hangs, we can like remotely reboot it and stuff like that. But we get a graph of our power utilization. So we know when we need to buy more you know, power. Or we can actually, uh, our graph looks really weird. You can, you can see when... Whenever we start uh, having issues with Bitcoin, our power <laughs> utilization drops right down. Yes, yes. So if Bitcoin goes down, our power graph drops by about like seven. Yes, amps. yes. That's so funny you say that because that's honestly the last couple of times I've noticed that Deep Bit was down, which hasn't happened for a little bit. The last couple of times that was by power usage. Yeah. 
I just saw the power utilization yeah. on my graph just dip because all the video cards went to standby. Um, the other thing, like with a lot of like uh, like Linux systems, you can install these packages that will expose a ton of system information and Windows boxes too. Yep. A, a ton of information via SNMP, and you can password protect it with encryption, and it'll tell you things yep. like everything from CPU to disk stats, all kinds of stuff right. you can get, and like switch information too from like your yeah. switches and. We use it on our switches to monitor bandwidth and yeah. for each server and so on. But yeah, from from a from mostly our servers is what we monitor the most, and we do CPU load, the load average, uh, the temperature of the CPU, because uh, we can oh, yeah, we can yeah. see like when our when our ISP does maintenance on their air conditioners, we actually see a change. Uh, how much hmm. free memory there is on the server? That's always good to know over time. Oh yeah, like I'm out of memory right now, but have I always been out of memory, or is it just something recent? Are you familiar uh, with Splunk? That's what Clicker uh, in the chat room says he uses to pull all the stats in and so, really generate like some amazing reports. Yeah, it's like a log analyzer, but it's mm, not that free. Right. That's that's the thing. But uh, or it has like a free download. But I, I've I've yeah, looked at it very briefly. The free download can't be password protected. Well, you'd have to put it like a reverse uh, proxy in front of it, whatever. Uh, so the free download is meant you have to like restrict it to being accessed inside a LAN or mm -hmm. something. Okay. Similarly, okay. not production worthy like Might that. Might be fun to play with, though. Yep. But we monitor like the swap usage, the number of active processes, which makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can tell when there's a spike in like the threads in a MySQL server or something like that. Mm -hmm. Also, uptime. We monitor the uptime, and so if we ever see it go down, we know that, that machine rebooted, and maybe that needs to set off an alert because you know that machine wasn't expected to reboot well and again historically you could start to see that doot, 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 trick down you oh boy look at this the box is becoming one of our more unreliable systems yeah you can see the little graph yeah yep. uh free disk space that's always one that you forget to check right and then all of a sudden it's like hey it's out of disk space and you know the mysql server will hang and sit there and wait until you free up some disk space and that can cause all kinds of issues and even data loss so mm -hmm. yeah hmm. so and we also monitor our web servers very closely. So we're looking at, we get uh, a complicated graph. I think I showed it to you the other day. And it shows the number of requests per second into the web server, the number of connections that are open on the web server, uh, how many of those are waiting for reading data, reading like a request from the user or writing the request to the user, or if they're waiting for the PHP to, to generate the response and things like that. Uh, Nagios monitoring can be taken even further when it really starts to do things that you wouldn't think of of a monitoring system. Some of those more advanced uh, SNMP demons can expose the list of packages installed on your system, whether that's mm -hmm. from like RPMs or the FreeBSD port system or whatever. I know the Red Hat Enterprise version of the SNMP uh, tools will do that. Yeah, and the, uh, the I think Net SNMP can do it for BSD. Mm. But you can have a, a Nagios tool that will monitor that list and compare it to something like that VUXML we were talking about and say, hey, the version of PHP you have it has a known vulnerability. And you can have that set off an alert. Oh, that's really handy. I never thought of that. Exactly. Right? I you like that's a good trick. That. Uh, another one is you can also have it monitor other things, like the expiration date of your domain name. If your domain name ever gets down to where it's going to expire within 14 days, that's an alert. That is so funny. You, you might as well put a meeting reminder in this thing. Yeah. You probably could. You probably could have it monitor an RSS feed that fed off a Google calendar that then fed into Nagios, which then generated alerts for meetings. Probably. I think you could do it, Alan. Although you could just have your Google calendar on your cell phone, which is what well, I did. Right. Yeah, you could do that, but, but that wouldn't be using that, Nagios. In brackets here, my notes specifically say, Chris should set up the domain name expiration monitoring for Jupyter Broadcasting so he doesn't forget to renew it every year. Yeah. But I, another, uh, one, another one is it can monitor your SSL certificates for when they expire. It can be fairly embarrassing when you're running a big e-commerce site and the SSL expires and nobody notices until you know, orders drop off uh, because everybody gets a big SSL warning and they're like, yeah, I'm not going to shop there. <laughs> right? Yeah. You want to make sure you get a warning when your SSL certificate is going to expire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise you look like a fool. Almost as bad as when your domain name expires for two years in a row. Yeah. Almost. Almost as bad. It's not quite as bad. There's nothing really much worse than, than that. But uh, that's just yeah. speaking from personal experience. Yep. But uh, Nagios supports two different methods of monitoring. The one we've been mostly talking about is active monitoring. Mm -hmm. Nagios will connect out to the server and check the status. But it also supports passive monitoring 
where the servers will push information to Nagios, which might make sense for uh, certain services or really complicated performance data. Uh, but it also can uh, come in handy for servers that aren't directly connected to the internet. Right? If you have a bunch of servers in a LAN that you know, can only connect out from behind NAT, yeah. you can't get into them with Nagios. So you can use passive monitoring. And with passive monitoring, Nagios will just say, hey, I haven't got an update from this server in 10 minutes. Maybe it's not responding properly. You know? So does it, it just, so it, when it does that, does it, okay, so it just assumes because it would have to be coming from the client. So it just has to yeah. make the assumption, the jump of logic there. Yeah, so that, you know, if I don't get an update from this service after so many minutes, that should trigger an alert. So it can do monitoring in a push or pull setup. So that's kind of yeah. nice. So. And it can also do ones where you just have it push the state where you can say just say you know passively tell you whether it's up or down depending on what it is mm -hmm. uh, but that can also come into handy remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about how your monitoring box like your Nagios box could actually be the weakest point in your network because mm -hmm. it's, it's got, it's got its hands into a ton of your machines it, yeah it's, it has direct connections to every one of your machines yeah, yeah. even the most secure ones that are yeah. protected and blocked from everything else right and they're all firewalled off so nothing can connect to them except for this Nagios box yeah and it probably and in some cases has some it logins might even have and SH key for mm -hmm. auto login so you don't even need a password because you're doing it all scripted yep and so for some of those hosts that need super security you can keep the Nagios blocks firewalled off and do and push the data out passively instead Right, so you don't allow any, uh, you know, unrequested connections coming in. You would just passively have that really secure host push data out to Nagios and don't allow any, you know, connections to be initiated from the outside. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Inside. Yeah, that's nice and secure, really. And and again, that applies to your machines on a LAN that are unroutable. They they don't have a way to connect out. Because that can also apply to virtual machines. Some of your virtual machines, you might not have running, you have them running in like the NAT mode, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so they don't have, there's no way to connect to that from the internet. So you would have it push the data to Nagios passively. Hmm. I could see that, I could see that being extremely useful in a lot of situations where I've had machines behind a NAT box where I can't get inbound. Uh, yep. and I could also see it where if you had a setup where you wanted to monitor for a bunch of clients. And you wanted to have the, essentially your different clients send to your central Nagio server. And then yep. you could call your own client and be like, hey, I'm sitting here, I'm monitoring your servers, and I just saw you had a hard drive problem. Guess what? I'm all over it. I'll be there two hour minimum. You know, that kind of a thing. That'd be kind of a and, nice uh, deal. Another thing with Nagios is you can set up uh, separate contacts where you can give clients uh, a login where they would only be able to see their servers. Oh, know, that's great. Yeah. Everybody's servers. Go to, they can go check on their own status of their system. Or if you're at a business, you know, you could go let your boss log in or something, but don't let him make any stupid changes or turn off any alerts or something, whatever you wanted to do. Hmm. Now, uh, I had heard that there are alternatives out there to Nagios. One that I was going to mention is Spiceworks, and Spiceworks yep. is more of a Windows so solution. Um, I've, so I've only used it a little bit, but it's more automated. It's free. You, just, you install it, and then you give it, like, all of your really important network credentials, and then it goes yep. out there and spiders and discovers once you give it the network blocks and tries to automatically in, uh, integrate with Active Directory and, and group users together. It'll do things like SNMP and it'll so it'll it'll list a it'll list a workstation that it found and if it can pull in the port information from the switch, it'll even tell you what switch port it's plugged into, what the switch name is and what its IP address is and what its MAC address is and all that kind of stuff. And if it's a Dell system, it'll even tell you when the warranty expires and all of the information about a service you know anything you give from the service tag, it'll pull in there. And uh, it's pretty nice. It also supports things like managing phones and I IP phones and stuff like that. It's Spiceworks. Again, it's free. But the problem with Spiceworks is because it's free, unlike, unlike Nagios, which is open source free, Spiceworks is like that kind of commercial free where it's like free, but there's a cost. And the cost is, is there's built-in ads to it. And the ads can be sometimes a little obnoxious because it's like, you're running low on storage. Would you like to buy a new disk array from CDW? And I'm kind of like, no, I, I wouldn't like to buy a new disk array. I would just like you to be quiet. <laughs> yep. But so that's Spiceworks. If, if Nagios sounds interesting to you, but it might be more than you're ready to bite off, Check out Spiceworks if you've got a Windows box. Yep. I, th I think it. I think you have to run on Windows. It's the only way I've I'm ever seen sure. it. And then there's uh, there's also one called Zabel. And then you were mentioning Cacti, but I've never used either of those. Zabbix, right? Zabbix is that what it's called? Yes, yeah, Zabbix. Zabbix 1.8.6 is out, but neither one of us have ever used that. Uh, but it looks like it's also free. So yep. that's a Cacti. A lot of people are giving a, a lot of people in the chat room are giving love to Cacti. Yeah. 
So there you go. So there's a there's a there's a couple of different options to keep track of your stuff. Now, are you gonna have one more next week for uh, Dreams Void, and then it's another at least one more, yeah, for Dreams Void. Now the Nagios questions. Uh, if you're out there and you have a really cool Nagios setup, I geek out on this stuff because I think about this stuff a lot. So I would love yep. to hear what you guys are doing, yeah, especially if you monitor something that people might not think of. Yeah, yeah. Like I love the idea of like monitoring the. Uh, the uh, you know not just one aspect of monitoring CPU usage with memory usage with page requests per second. I love like yep. the combination of those elements yep. where you can get that kind of data. Real insights. Mm -hmm. uh, should we move on to the roundup, Alan? Sure. All right. It is time for the roundup. Now these are stories that didn't quite make it into the big news story, but they are likely either submitted to our Reddit subpage at links.techsnap.tv or just ones we came across and saved because we wanted to share with you guys but didn't have a ton of info. Generally, the emphasis behind the Roundup is you can go look up more info on your own with the links provided in the show notes. I'll kick off this week's Roundup with our first story. It's all about Google hacking. Uh, sort of. I'll explain in a second. But Google hacking exposes large caches of personal data. What this really is is people out there, like this guy here, they're showing a picture of... Uh, they, you, people know how to use specially crafted Google searches to find information. And I guess Google recently, just recently, started indexing FTP sites. I didn't know that. And so now... I think they've been for a while. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it's according to this article, you can, you can use these specially crafted Google searches to find out all this caches information that have been left on FTP sites from the old archives of the internet way back. Uh -huh. Mysterious stuff. Anyways, it's actually kind of an interesting article. It's called, the uh, technical term for it is called Google dorking. So, if you'd like to read about Google dor dorking, there'll be a link in the show notes for that. Now, I remember Alan, what, one of the other games, I forget what it used to be called, but it was finding something on Google where there's exactly one result. Google whacking. Or Google whacking. <laughs> that seems like and a new... And the best part is, though, if you find one and then you post about it, it then makes it not one anymore. Right, because yeah. Because Google will find your post. Yeah, and index that, and that would show up in the search results. I didn't, even, I didn't even think you could search for anything and not get more than one result. Uh, now, the next story in the roundup, Alan, is one that I threw in there. Do you want to take it? Sure. Uh, Connect Exploit. Is basically, somebody's created a mashup of Connect, Metasploit, and a 3D first-person shooter type game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's built in Blender, and it, it sounds like it pretty much... This is so awesome. ...be quite a bit of fun. So Metasploit is like this awesome framework that is aware of different ways to exploit the vulnerabilities we talk about often on TechSnap. There are just tools out there where you can just have a nice menu and say, well, I got myself a Windows box, and it's got IIS on it, and here's the 400 vulnerabilities that IIS has been uh, vulnerable to in the past. Select the one you'd like to use. This guy and at then, DEF CON, though, he amped it up by combining Connect. Yep, we hooked it up with a Connect and made it into a game. Wow. That is really a whole new level that of... Is. That's like stuff you see in the movies. Uh, I'll just, I'll just yeah. give a brief mention here. Uh, just for a historical uh, note, I think a lot of us yep. have uh, used Slashdot over the years, and uh, Commander sure. Taco is uh, resigning. And I think all of us are, who are Slashdot fans are familiar with Commander Taco. Now, he wrote up a big post over at Slashdot, and I'll, I'll let you guys go read it. But uh, like he always says, pants are optional. And uh, it's a good post. And I guess I, guess I sh should also mention that it's kind of ironic that I would mention that Commander Taco is stepping down and not mention that Steve Jobs also resigned yesterday, which I think mm -hmm. everybody knows about. But might as well make a mention it here in TechSnap so when we look back at episode 20, we'll remember that's where we were uh, the, the week that uh, Steve Jobs resigned. Um, all right, Alan, do you want to take this one about the anonymous breaches from yes, another uh, U.S. defense contractor? That's basically the story there, yes. Anonymous uh, breached yet another U.S. defense contractor, and Slashdot has more details. <laughs> that is really something. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one gig of, of private emails and documents from a U.S. defense company they're going to, they're gonna, or they have released. Right. Yeah, we talked about that one a little bit before, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is uh, the thing that uh, I guess they're going after them now, uh, and they're, they're looking to give some of these guys 25 years in prison. They're, they talk all about it here in this article, so yep. it's, it's worth to go check out. Now, I don't know much about this one because I just caught the headline, but I'll read the, I'll read the headline now, and maybe you can fill in some of the details here. Yep. Uh, Microsoft is dropping the use of super cookies on MSN.com. Right. Now, now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about these yes. uh, using the uh, e-tag header to basically use the browser's cache to trick the user. So even if they deleted their cookies, uh, because their browser cache reserved this one file, they'd be able to recreate the cookie and know that it was the same user because they had the same cache files. Do you want to take this last, uh, this last one in the roundup too? Sure. And uh, the SpyEye banking trojan, which is one of those trojans like we talked about uh, 
quite a few weeks ago where it was it waits for you to log into your online banking and then hijacks it. Uh, it will, it's it can do that and a bunch of other things. And basically, it was it sold to cyber criminals for money, and it would come locked down to your hardware, so that you could only you could generate the virus that the customized version of the Trojan you wanted, but only on the computer that it was locked to. That but, is crazy. But uh, some uh, a different group of hackers called the Reverse Engineering Dream Crew. Uh, managed to reverse engineer it and get the source code back. And so now they've leaked the source code for this massive iSpy banking trojan. Wow. So the source code's just out there for anyone to use. Wow. So you're telling me that the private virus and trojan market is so sophisticated now that they, they, they can... They have really strong DRM. They, these, yeah, these viruses have DRM? Virus Basically, DRM? Are you essing well, me? No. No, it's it's the program that creates the customized version of the virus that has the DRM. Okay. But yeah. Oh, I don't care. That's crazy. It, is. it seems like completely anti everything these guys would be about. And they're using it. Once they get in the position well, of being essentially of people, a commercial entity, they're using yeah. the same effing tactics. Well, the the people that buy, you know, banking trojans are not hackers. They're just, you know, it's the Russian mafia and so on. Oh, true. Just out there to, to steal money. But still, it's so the hackers that are selling that the, the, the DRM yeah. creator. Hmm. Well, well, they so don't want to have their stuff pirated either. Well, good. Now this spy eye Trojan source code can go have a party with the uh, Stuxnet source code that are both floating around yes. online. And oh, my gosh. Together and oh, my God. <laughs> this one is also a good example of uh, patient malware that will just wait for you to do the thing it wants. It won't abuse your system. It'll try to stay low-key so you don't even know it's there. It just sits in the background and waits for you to do the thing it's programmed to wait for. And that's pretty scary. All right, let's move on to the Bitcoin Blaster segment. We wrap up every tech snap with a little bit of Bitcoin news. And uh, this week, one of the things I think I'll start out with is uh, one that I've had my eye on for a little while now because those GPUs run hot and use a ton of power. And the solution may be on the horizon. One of the first commercial FPGA boards was, has uh, gone into production. Now, they're still available in very limited quantities, and they cost about $400 a board right now, but they only use 6.8 watts of power, and they can produce 100 mega hashes a second. And they also think they can get that up to 150 or even 200 mega hashes with some improvements. Again, yep. 7 watts of power. Yeah. This is now, really going as, to be... You know, my Bitcoin box uses like at least 700 watts. Yeah, yeah. To generate 1,250 mega hashes. I've got, I've got to be pulling at least in total over a thousand watts. I gotta be I, that now. I mean, I've got, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, all right. Uh, it, I linked to a BitcoinMiner.com. A couple of people wrote up about this, but again, BitcoinMiner.com is proving to be a great resource for miners, yep. and, uh, and they have a really nice write-up. They're saying right now that. It's not quite as effective as GPU mining, but if enough people order them where they can get the, the you know, economies of scale and get the yeah. price down, that could help. I think and all also, of all of the parts know, should, uh, should accommodate economies of scale, too. There isn't, like, some precious part on here that's going to become more expensive as they produce more, I don't think. Right. I think it should be a pretty general purpose system. Um, yeah. But the first thing that I worry about is once that happens, then we're just going to go on a ride of difficulty like we haven't seen before, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, did you hear, you know, you remember my Bitcoin... It was a disaster. A lot of people lost a lot of money. I thought I'd lost all my money. And then uh, later on, I found out I got 49% back, which was better than nothing. And now the latest story, there's not really many details on it, but, but it's coming from the My Bitcoin guys directly on their status page. They're claiming they're going to release the My Bitcoin, uh, I believe it's the payment processing code. I don't think it's all of their source code, but they're going to release uh -huh. source code in, for the My Bitcoin project. Well, that was Open specifically source. something we talked about the other week when they went away and when uh, Trade Hill bought Bitcoin.com or WeUseCoins.com or whatever one it was, uh, is that one of the main things my Bitcoin was doing was making it easier for merchants to accept Bitcoins. And if that's the part yes. they're going to open source, that could be uh, a big deal. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm showing a, an example of what the code could possibly be. And, and basically it is uh, initiate, steal, return zero. <laughs> There's their source code. Yep. <laughs> I love Reddit. Uh, right. it, well, I, I want to start. I want to start doing two things for Jupiter Broadcasting. I want to start taking donations in Bitcoin. 
Because if Bitcoin goes up, if we could take donations of Bitcoin today and then sell those Bitcoins six months from now, we could earn a nice little profit there. Uh, but two, uh, I want to start taking advertising uh, buys in Bitcoin. And the nice thing that my Bitcoin did was they had this whole like PayPal-esque automatic, here's your information, here's your Bitcoin address, here's their Bitcoin address, yeah. submit pay. And it would and do the transaction. tying the transaction to which person so that yep. you could tie them back together. So I'm, I'm by thinking default, that's... Bitcoin's trying to keep it anonymous, right? Right. So if a bunch of people donate, you, so you could come up with a, a new donation address, put it on the website, and everybody can donate to it. Right. But then you can't match up whose donation was whose to be able to put them on the thank you page if they want to be on the thank you page. Right. If this is like a black a black hat kind of podcast or some sort of illicit you know podcast, then maybe we would want everybody to be anonymous. But I want to give people credit and thank them for donating. And but yeah. so yeah, I need that. So I'm hoping yeah. that's the bit. And I'm pretty sure it is based on their language that they're going to be releasing to the public. And that really actually could be a huge long term thing for the Bitcoin community. Because yes. if, if that gets better and and takes off, then that means more merchants can accept it, which means Bitcoin's become more useful, mm -hmm. and that will keep the price up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I think we mentioned it last week, but the uh, first Bitcoin conference that's ever been held kicked off in New York uh, in, over the last week. And uh, the Bitcoin show, I'll put a link to uh, their, the keynote video. Uh, they've posted a few videos from the Bitcoin conference. And it's, you know, it's a small-scale conference, but it's very cool. And uh, the one I've linked in the show notes is uh, from uh, um, the, uh, the keynote. So go over there, check that out, and watch this if you'd like. It's, uh, it's 35 minutes, and he, got, he quickly covers the state of Bitcoin for about the first 10 minutes or so. And he kind of gets into where it's going, where, where all that kind of stuff is. So it's an interesting listen, especially if you're really passionate about Bitcoin. And I also included uh, in the uh, Bitcoin Blaster segment just a, a write-up. In case you don't want to watch, you'd rather read, you can do that yeah, as well. Yeah, and I think that write-up covers a bit more about uh, some of the startups, the Bitcoin yes. startups, and what they're doing. Yep, yep, thank you for mentioning that. I think I we'll see some uh, interesting stuff out of that. Yeah, if you're curious what businesses are starting up around Bitcoin, that's a good one to go read. And that's the last link in yep. the uh, Blaster segment. Helen, is that all the tech snap we have for today? I don't think that's all the tech snap. Dude, all right. So I'll give a few people the details. If you'd like to get a hold of us, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can always submit stories, show ideas to links.techsnap.tv. You can also check out our Facebook page over at facebook.com slash techsnap. And there's the email address, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And you can send yep. in your questions, so show suggestions, all those kinds of things. Like Alan and I are fond of saying, a lot of times the advice we give out for free on this show would be advice we'd charge people people lots of dollars an hour for so we welcome yep. you to take advantage of that offer and we love doing it yep. so send those in to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com and be sure to tune in every friday morning over jupiter or not tune in that's kind of an odd way to put it be sure yes. to visit jupiter broadcasting every friday morning uh, to get the latest episode of techsnap available in hd or standard def or audio only whichever you like or catch us live at jblive.tv yes. on actually, thursdays Tune in on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific to watch live. That would be the correct way to use the term tune in. That would be the yes. correct use because then you get to join well, this awesome chat room. N nobody uses tune in is not the right word anymore now that you're not actually using a TV tuner, right? To I, mean, I can't just be like really, the right frequency. And <laughs> I just want to be really awesomely retro, man. I just want to be I like, know. you know, tune it in that, that the, with those rabbit antennas and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, maybe I don't actually miss that at all. In fact, I take all that back. I'll take it over IP any day. All right, everyone. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for watching this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you next week.